Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the National Network of Credit and Financial Professionals. I am here today with Ken Mark and Michael Sullivan from Grant Thornton who will be presenting on forensic accounting. A few items to get out of the way before we begin. If you have any questions during the course of the presentation, you can ask them through the questions function on your side panel. We will gather all those questions and save them for a Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you are looking for a copy of the slides to follow along today, they will be made available after the presentation. We will also be sending a copy through email after the presentation is complete. The last item is that we will have a brief survey that pops up after the webinar ends. It only takes about 30 seconds to fill out, but it gives us a lot of great information on how we can continue to make our webinars better for you. Now, Ken Frisco will give you a brief intro of our speakers today. Okay, thanks, Sharon. Uh, our You're first welcome. speaker is Ken Yormark, and he's the Managing Director in Grant Thornton LLP's Forensic Advisory Services Practice. He has over 25 years of experience in the areas of forensic investigative services, having managed and conducted numerous complex often high-profile securities fraud, anti-corruption, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and Ponzi scheme investigations involving public and private companies in all industries around the globe. He focuses his practice on accounting issues, forensic accounting, financial investigations, securities litigation, and anti-corruption risk assessments. Our second speaker is Michael Sullivan. He is a senior manager in Grant Thornton's Forensic Advisory Services practice located in New York, New York. Mike has a significant experience in managing a wide variety of matters, assisting both companies and attorneys with forensic accounting matters, fraud investigations, the assessment of damages, post-acquisition disputes, litigation support, financial modeling, data analytics, valuation analysis, and other financial and accounting analysis. His primary industry experience is in the financial services, construction, and retail industries. I'd like to welcome both speakers and turn the presentation back to both of them to begin the webinar. Thanks very much, Ken, <clears throat> and to Sharon. So this is Mike Sullivan, and as Ken just mentioned, uh, you know I'm here with uh, my colleague Ken Yormark, and we're going to be giving you a relatively brief overview of uh, the forensic accounting. Uh, profession and how uh, some of the techniques and observations that <clears throat> excuse me that we make as part of our services uh, might be useful uh, for you all on the phone uh, in your um, in your areas of expertise just a, a little bit of brief background about the firm that uh, that we're we're a part of Grant Thornton is a is a global public accounting firm set up similar to other accounting firms. Uh, we have three primary service lines, audit, tax, and advisory <clears throat> uh, in, uh, in over 130 countries globally. Ken and I work in our forensic advisory services practice, uh, which is part of the advisory service line uh, in, a, uh, in a special department called business risk. And we like to think of ourselves as the protectors of the value that our clients possess. In terms of our uh, flow of, of, uh, of the presentation today, we're going to start by uh, discussing some basic fundamentals of accounting that, that we are assuming most of the folks on the phone uh, are already familiar with, but we'll give, um, we'll kind of touch on some key concepts of GAAP uh, and how certain fundamental accounting concepts can, can be important when you. Then we're going to discuss uh, the forensic accounting field and uh, sort of how, how fraud and the detection of fraud plays into that and some of the other services that the forensic accountant provides. And then we'll talk about uh, sort of the meat of the presentation here, which is the, uh, 
uh, the areas of risk that we often see as part of our work uh, that might be uh, that we hope is uh, is interesting and relevant uh, for you all. So just to start with some basic accounting fundamentals, GAAP uh, or the generally accepted accounting principles is the most common framework uh, around which financial statements are prepared. Uh, and the creation of GAAP has been gradual uh, over the last, I guess, 80 years or so. And um, although it is not unique to uh, public companies, that is, public registrants uh, that register with the Securities and Exchange Commission, it is typically, uh, it is required uh, for public companies to follow GAAP. Um, and most private companies look to the public company requirements as the, as the sort of standard um, to, uh, to, to employ in, in their own financial preparation. So the SEC has historically deferred the uh, kind of accounting uh, standard process to certain private bodies, most notably the AICPA and the FASB, to create what we consider to be generally accepted accounting principles. Then, of course, you can't have rules without a regulator to enforce them. So the PCAOB, which is the Public Companies uh, Advisory Oversight Board, uh, is tasked with, uh, I guess, really the regulator for public auditing firms who are to follow uh, generally accepted auditing standards um, to review those financial statements. We'll talk in a minute about the responsibilities that both uh, management, who are the financial statement owners, and the auditors have, and things to be aware of when you're reviewing financial statements. Another fundamental element of accounting, which can have uh, a very significant impact on the financial results that you're reviewing, is the basis that it's prepared on. Now, GAAP requires the accrual basis, um, but it is also possible to prepare financial statements on a cash basis. And the, the basic difference is, under cash basis, financial statements reflect uh, results once cash has either been dispersed or received. And under the accrual basis, there's much more of a matching principle that, um, that is used. So, if a, an expense, for example, is known, then uh, that expense is reported. It does not have to have been paid, uh, and it does not have to have been invoiced. Uh, it's more of, it puts the, the onus on the financial statement owner to accurately reflect the financial condition uh, based on what is known and knowable. So this is this is actually the the first point that um, we'll make with regard to uh, where judgment potentially might come into play. Um, so cash basis is fairly cut and dry. If you've received it, it's it's revenue. If you haven't received it, it's not. Um, in the accrual basis, there is judgment involved as far as when you in fact can reflect uh, an earnings uh, of of work that you've actually performed or not performed. Um, and we will go into several areas where judgment comes into play and as a result uh, where potential uh, potential um, misdeeds can be done with regard to the reporting of financial statements. Go ahead, Mike. Great. Yep, and that's a theme that will be, uh, I guess it's really fundamental to forensic accounting, which is um, to hone in on the areas where judgment and assumptions and estimates are used. Which is uh, which is very um, can be very often and prevalent in financial statement preparation. So, uh, assuming that most of the folks listening are familiar with how you know how financial statements are laid out, um, you've got uh, typically you think of three statements: your balance sheet, your income statement, and your cash flow. But almost the most important, or what can be the most important element to financial statements. Uh, and this um, relates back to what we were just discussing, which is many uh, assumptions and judgments that are made are required to be disclosed in a, a reasonable amount of detail in the notes to the financials. Not everything, uh, 
uh, it would be nice to think that all relevant information has been reported, um, but it is, it is at least uh, the best window that a user has into um, you know, areas that may be subject to you know, appropriate estimation or potentially manipulation. And if I could just make a, a quick comment, just to, uh, in a comparison between the balance sheet and the income statement, for example. So you could almost picture the balance sheet as being a, a picture in time. Um, and the balance sheet is, is a financial statement that will always remain intact. Um, at the end of the year, the, the amounts in that statement will flow to the following year. Um, whereas with the income statement, that is really an accumulation uh, for a specific period in time. So it's almost like a, a, a moving picture in comparison to what you consider to be a picture that doesn't move in time of the balance sheet. And at the end of whatever given period that might be, for example, a full year, the income statement really wipes itself clean and starts from scratch again. And you're starting to build that income statement again from, from zero. Uh, because the profit or the loss gets pulled into retained earnings, which is a part of your balance sheet. Yep. Thanks, Ken. Now, this um, this next topic here comes from the concept statements. Uh, so this is this is an even more granular and more fundamental element of financial information that. Is, um, is required for financial information to be useful, uh, which is sort of a, a, a key term. Um, first, it needs to be relevant and reliable. So by relevant, it means the information presented has to give the user some perspective, useful perspective, on the past, present, and future of the company's performance. So you could call that predictive value feedback value. Um, of course, if there, is, if there is manipulation of those financial statements, that can compromise the information's relevance. Similarly, um, reliability, <coughs> which is uh, you know, another fundamental concept here, <coughs> needs to be what they call representatively faithful, verifiable, and neutral. So verifiable meaning there needs to be some ability to recreate that information. Uh, and to auditors, that's really important. And um, to, to users of financial statements that want to challenge the, uh, the, the kind of reliability of the information, the, the kind of logical request to make is, show me, show me the support. You know, show me the contracts. Show me the invoices. Um, demonstrate to me how this accrual was calculated. And these are all asks and requests that forensic accountants make uh, constantly on a daily basis. Uh, and of course, neutrality in the financials means that there is no bias on the part of the financial statement creator. And that might sound a little bit um, kind of inevitable, but if gap is followed appropriately, uh, and if information is disclosed appropriately, there should be no, oh, there should be minimal bias. Uh, in the numbers being presented. Again, that's, these are all the areas where forensic accountants are often brought in to, uh, to analyze. In terms of the significance of the information, comparability and consistency is key. So by comparability, what we mean is financial information is almost, it, it is useful um, with almost without exception, uh, when compared to some benchmark. So that would be either sorry, the uh, previous year's performance. It could be a competitor's performance. Uh, it could be a certain metric or ratio that you're reviewing. Uh, but the comparability of the financial information is, is essential. Uh, that also plays into the consistency concept, which is if you're you know, if financial statements are, are rely heavily on accounting uh, policies and guidance, basically gap requirements, 
that will influence how the results are reported. And if you're showing two periods of results using different standards or different accounting treatments, they lose the consistency necessary to be uh, useful. So oftentimes what we'll see is uh, inappropriate accounting being done in one period, which makes that period uh, no longer comparable or consistent with the other pre periods presented on the financial statements, which could result in their need to restate uh, financials, which can be a very cumbersome and intense process. So now we're going to spend um, the next few minutes talking about the forensic accounting profession and how that plays in and is different from um, uh, what most people think of a standard accountant or auditor. So first, usually, I mean, it, the, the most, um, one of the most common areas where forensic accountants become involved is when there is either a suspicion, allegation, or evidence of fraud. So what is financial statement fraud? Well, we view it in sort of two, two lights, uh, what we call asset misappropriation and financial statement fraud. Asset misappropriation is essentially just stealing. So that can be, uh, you know, re removing assets from a company for a particular employee's gain or for certain shareholders' gain. Um, and it can be as simple as taking money out of the, out of the bank account. Financial statement fraud really is uh, the misrepresentation of financial results or financial information with the intent to deceive the user. Uh, this is often much harder to, well, both, both areas here are, are, are potentially extremely difficult to detect. Um, but the financial statement fraud element is the, is the, um, is where many forensic accountants spend uh, a lot of time. And so, and I'll add, I'll add just add one point here, Mike. Um, you know, oftentimes uh, we are asked to come in, and there might be a, a level of suspicion already. So we have some level of guidelines where uh, there's either a whistleblower accusation. Uh, there might have been somebody who abruptly left the company and they find things within his emails. Uh, there are a number of reasons why we potentially might get, get brought into uh, to a case. Um, but what we are clearly trying to do is establish some of the incentives and some of the reasons why people would go ahead and commit these kinds of financial frauds. Um, is there a monetary incentive for them from a bonus perspective? Was there, a, was there an incentive for them to, to reach another level of promotion within the organization? Or is it just that they were just trying to siphon funds off to uh, an entity that they owned uh, or to uh, a person that they knew? Yep. And what's interesting, too, about financial statement fraud is that there are also circumstances where there is no direct benefit to the, uh, the I guess, fraudster, which is a which is an old school term that's often still used. Um, but whether there is um, whether there is necessarily benefit or not, uh, it, it's it's that intention to deceive the user uh, that can that that makes it significant. Um, what is also relevant here is that for appropriate, even for uh, appropriate and audited financial statements, there is still the need to take representations from management. So representations from management basically means uh, a, a sort of um, on your honor uh, a, a commitment from, from management indicating that everything that is included in those financial statements has not been misrepresented. Uh, and the auditors will um, will perform, you know, very intense and uh, comprehensive testing to confirm that representation. But at the end of the day, it is management who is responsible for the for the contents. 
And, and just to clarify one thing, I mean, when an audit is done, the auditor's responsibility is not to find fraud. Um, that is not something uh, that is an expectation. Um, they, are, they are not looking um, at things in the same level of detail as we might look at if we were brought in for, for reasons of suspicion. Um, so just, just understand that um, the accounting firm, when they come in the door um, to do their audit, uh, that, that is not their number one priority. If they happen to find it, they have to bring that uh, forward and elevate that through the board and, and through management, but that is not their number one priority. Exactly. <clears throat> So that brings us to kind of our, our next topic of what is forensic accounting and how is that different from your uh, other varieties of, of accountants and auditors. <clears throat> so as Ken mentioned, um, the, a financial statement audit provides reasonable assurance that fraud would be detected uh, if it were material to the financial statements. So that's, that goes along with, with any other material misstatement that, that might exist. Uh, but as Ken mentioned, there is a, there's a very different set of procedures that are used uh, when there is a suspicion or evidence of, of fraud that exists that forensic accountants would, would pursue uh, much more in much more detail. So, um, so that fraud examination, when, when the time comes, uh, Typically, either that can, a fraud examination can be performed internally by a company's internal audit group or compliance groups, uh, but most often it is a professional firm uh, like ours who would be brought in to perform an independent uh, fraud examination, which is a which is a key piece of any successful uh, forensic matter is the the assurance that the that the team performing the work is not in any way influenced by the outcome. Um, you know, it's, uh, so further there, um, instead of accepting management's representations as is appropriate in other areas of, of accounting, for a forensic accountant, it's more about um, investigative interviews done with management and with key personnel, and it is much more about confirming um, uh, confirming information against third-party created source documentation. So that would be uh, documents like negotiated contracts, um, you know, uh, terms of, of, uh, of real estate holdings, um, invoices and, and other purchase orders uh, that, that are done in a more complete and uh, scrutinized basis. The other important thing um, a concept that, that forensic accountants know and, and hold near and dear is that this idea of materiality uh, does not really apply. So when, um, when auditors and, and under accepted standards uh, are reviewing financial statements for differences uh, and uh, 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 I guess what you would call um, either differences from the underlying records or uh, uh, unexplained or unreconcilable issues, if it falls below a certain materiality level, that is, it's not significant to the numbers, to the other numbers in the financial statement, it's often acceptable to simply waive that, waive that amount, um, kind of just accept it and, and know that it's not going to materially affect the user. For a forensic accountant, there is no materiality, and that is, if it's off by a dollar, it's wrong, uh, and that mentality is really important um, to detect many of the schemes that that, is, that are that are used. Um, I, I like to refer to forensic accountants as kind of a, accountants with an attitude. Um, we we tend to we tend to not be satisfied with answers that are gray in their nature. Um, the other thing that is very telling about the difference between your, your standard audit and what would be a forensic accounting audit would be that uh, an audit tends to have a very much of a checklist approach. So the auditor has, uh, uh, literally has a checklist they will move through and, and the goal is to get all of those line items completed and checked off. 
Um, forensic accountants have, while we have certain things that we ultimately know we are probably going to do on each investigation, um, we never know which way it's going to turn, depending on the documentation that we find or the interview that we might, we might have, which is going to lead us down a new path. So I, I, I kind of equate us to being um, starting with, with a blank sheet of paper and we build from there. And we really don't know which way we're going to twist and turn during the course of the investigation. So there's a lot more creativity involved in, in the work that a forensic accountant does, uh, a lot more people skills required uh, where we're really trying to engage with people in the organization. Um, I find that one of the most helpful things to do oftentimes is not just to speak to management, but to go down to uh, the loading docks. Or, or talk to the people who are, um, you know, in kind of these blue collar type positions in an organization, talk to the security guards and ask them about activity that's taken place. And you'd be surprised how much they would love to have a conversation about things. And they love to be asked questions and they will share information that many people in upper management would never even conceive of having a conversation about. Yep. <clears throat> Absolutely. And that um, kind of leads in again to uh, some of the, the the related areas of the work that we do. Uh, so we're we're here in this presentation focusing mostly on investigations, um, but there are a lot of uh, I guess co uh, complementary and overlapping uh, areas of focus to uh, to um, other specializations. So. Uh, corporate compliance, which is which is a similar uh, area, but typically involves uh, more in regulatory matters, either initiated by or required by uh, a regulatory body, and whether that's the, the SEC or or the FBI or OFAC, we could be brought in to uh, to investigate, uh, you know, at, at the corporate level. Typically, uh, Grant Thornton would be brought in um, after the issue has been identified, um, but often, um, d uh, often we'd be brought in to kind of complete the the, the work and to uh, lend that that third party objective uh, uh, perspective. Litigation and dispute consulting. Uh, it, well, very often the matters in which forensic accountants are involved will result in litigation or pre-litigation activity. So forensic accountants are well versed in conducting our work so that our observations and findings will be treated appropriately uh, in a litigation context. And um, that's, uh, that's another kind of learned skill set that uh, we, we kind of cross the boundary into almost a legal expertise uh, in terms of whether our opinions should be made available uh, externally from the client, or whether they really are protected uh, under, uh, you know, what we call the uh, the attorney work product doctrine, um, and are really only available to to management. And navigating that landscape requires a, a lot of experience uh, and uh, the ability to interact with lawyers and uh, legal teams uh, pretty seamlessly. Yeah, and this is this is the area where you would most commonly see um, a forensic accountant um, getting themselves in a position where they are an expert witness. So they might end up uh, being uh, deposed, or they might end up actually sitting on the stand in a jury trial um, and and basically spewing their knowledge and giving their expert testimony with regard to some damage calculations or some economic analysis that they had performed. Uh, forensic technology, uh, which sounds very cool and it, and it often is very cool, um, involves uh, the use of oftentimes state-of-the-art technology that can really advance an investigation. Uh, and we've been discussing very often we don't take representations. Uh, we're not able to rely on information provided by individuals at, at companies that may be implicated or may have participated in some sort of fraud uh, and so we have our own experts who can go in 
and arrive at the answer without the interaction from, from employees. So what does that mean? Uh, it means oftentimes harvesting emails from email servers uh, that get loaded into um, these massive databases and reviewed for uh, indications of collusion, uh, conspiracy, or, uh, or other corruption that oftentimes form the basis of our work plans. So the discussions that individuals are having when they don't think anybody is listening, uh, that winds up being extremely valuable and uh, informs uh, many elements of our work. Um, there's a lot of predictive analytic uh, and algorithms used as part of this process as well. Um, it's, it's actually amazing when you see our team show up with these briefcases full of, of God only knows what, what the, the tools in there do, but they'll go into a room and come out two hours later with, with more information than you ever thought was existed in the room in the first place. Um, so it's, it's a critical component to the work that we do as well. Yeah, we're finding more and more, I mean, just about every single engagement that we get involved in, obviously there's some level of data analytics or computer forensics that's needed, uh, whether it's pulling the data off of laptops or servers so that we can then go back and do analytics on that information. It, it's critical to everything that we do. And more and more, I'm sure you'll all agree, um, data has just, it, it's, it's enveloped us. Um, and every year, the amount of data that's available just just increases by many, many, many multitudes. So the only way we can get our arms around some of this information is to be using uh, the kinds of tools that Mike just described, which will give us the opportunity to take terabytes of data and cull it down into a manageable population so that we can actually go ahead and do a review of what we think is is substantive and really uh, very relevant to the issues that we are focused on. Yep. Certainly. So the, the potential steps in a forensic investigation, uh, very similar to what we've been describing so far, uh, first step is typically to obtain the evidence, uh, whether it's through a combination of requests in our forensic technology team form the analysis that Kem just described, um, and report or, uh, or at a minimum draw our findings, uh, occasionally testify, and that is a, um, I'm, I'm hopeful that very few people on the phone uh, have ever had the opportunity or the, the need to offer verbal testimony, but it's, it can be very uh, arduous, and um, there, uh, there is a, a whole skill set that goes along with with uh, delivering expert testimony. <clears throat> and then there is also um, a, a key component of what we do, which is the remediation element. Uh, so when there has been instances of fraud uh, or wrongdoing, making sure that the company has the tools needed to uh, eliminate the problem and prevent it from recurring. All right, I think now we are <clears throat> into some of the kind of specific areas of risk that we see uh, in, our, in our normal course business here. So this is the fraud triangle, which is um, a very familiar image and concept for, for forensic accountants. Uh, and it really, the purpose of this is to demonstrate for fraud to occur, so the intention to deceive um, a financial statement user in this case, for fraud to occur, there needs to be at least two, if not all three, of these elements present. So the, the three points are pressure, uh, opportunity, and realization. So by pressure, we mean there has to be some force motivating uh, the individual or the company to, to conduct the wrongdoing. So that can be uh, something as simple as the company is struggling and um, but knows that in order to remain in its in its current position in the market, it must, under any circumstance, uh, report strength and positive results, which is something that is very common uh, in most businesses nowadays. Um, so that sort of pressure, though, can uh, result in uh, bad acts occurring. 
So usually we see this when um, you know there have been declines and extra stresses on a particular company or a particular industry, uh, and but you know lo and behold, uh, certain companies are are posting you know record profits. Uh, there may well be explanations that uh, those sorts of results. Uh, there may not. Um, so that that but that pressure is is something that's required. Uh, management can also exert an extreme amount of pressure on its teams to produce and to uh, and to you know arrive at results that may not be realistic or may not be uh, reasonably achievable, and the the teams responsible for you know the operational teams feel that they have the obligation to uh, to, to do whatever it takes. And, and we'll talk about that concept in a second here, too. Um, oftentimes, management uh, and owners' personal financials uh, situation may be impacted by posting uh, real results. And so manipulated results are used as an alternative to prevent personal financial loss, whether it's a, a guarantee of, of debts um, or whether it's the, that management has a significant ownership. Uh, that would be affected by by negative earnings. Um, opportunities. So this is this is another important area for all of us to consider is in, in our day to day use of financial information and interaction with with management. And that is what uh, what opportunity is there to affect this sort of inappropriate result? And most often we see the the opportunity being a low internal control environment. So what does that mean? That means that for a company to have strong internal controls, you know, you want to see segregation of duties. Uh, you want to see a, a, a kind of a, a comprehensive reporting structure where wrongdoing can be uh, can be reported. Um, you know, for example, if if splitting the uh, the responsibility for certain functions among multiple people. Um, so that's a that's a that's a key area to be aware of. Um, another opportunity area might be that the company has significant influence in the market uh, or amongst its uh, customers, and can can generate or can realize non arm's length um, business dealings. So, for example, if a company is you know makes a, a, a a chemical or or some other material that's critical for the production of iPhones, um, they may have additional additional leverage, uh, and they may ask for a favor essentially um, that could positively impact them from a reporting standpoint. Uh, that if they were more, if the environment was more competitive, uh, you know that that situation might not be might not be possible. Um, Another exposure area there is when uh, the company has significant related party transactions. So uh, maybe it's a part of a global conglomerate where there's a lot of business done with uh, related parties. Again, uh, we've seen it numerous times where those transactions are, are either borderline or just simply not arm's length, uh, and the, that has the effect of manipulating the results. Uh, the kind of last point uh, I'll mention here under uh, opportunity is uh, the organizational structure is complex or unstable. So if if we observe high turnover in senior management um, or you know legal counsel or the compliance department has been dissolved, uh, those sorts of factors can also be uh, very telling uh, and indicate that um, that that additional review is necessary. In terms of the attitudes and, and I guess rationalizations, which is the third point on the triangle, this is really uh, you know what what uh, I'm sure all of us have felt at some point um, in, in our professional experience, which is you know this is just how this is done. Um, it, it very often, employees and, and operational folks will say, "My boss gave me this instruction, and so I." Didn't want to get fired, and so I did what my boss told me. 
you know, sometimes that, that doesn't fly when it's when it's clearly devious um, or, or even illegal. But that's a, that's how that individual rationalized it. Um, oftentimes, companies with reputations for uh, violations of law or regula regulation, you know, the, the the members of those teams may just think, you know, what this is just how how it's done. Um, the company has gotten away with it before, so we'll we'll you know we'll try it again. All um, elements that can lead to fraud. So, so um, Mike, Mike, if you could just step back for one second, back to that slide. Um, sure. Um, I, there's a there's a theory I like to discuss when I see this this triangle. Um, I call it the 20-60-20 scenario. So, 20% um, of the world are, are are good people, right? 20% of the people. Um, will always do the right thing. Uh, they're very moral, very forward, straightforward, and, 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 and they're not the kind of people that we ever have to worry about. Uh, then there's the other side of the spectrum, which is the 20% who are always trying to figure out an angle. They're always trying to figure out a way to, to, to cheat somebody. They're always trying to figure out a way to get a, uh, another dollar out of your pocket or another dollar out of their corporation's pocket. Um, and that's the 20% that's going to always keep keep me in business. Um, it's the 60% in the middle that we predominantly have to focus on because that 60% are the kinds of individuals who are, are really, they're, they're, in, um, they're on neither side of those spectrums. They're in the middle. And when the pressure might be intense and they can find some way to rationalize that bad behavior, they will make an attempt to try and do something inappropriate. The one thing that keeps them in check, and the third, the third piece of the triangle, which I think is the most important one, is the opportunity aspect. Because if those people test the waters because of those scenarios, and they don't see an opportunity there, it's very likely they will step back and not go ahead and do that dastardly deed. If they, however, see that there's a flaw in the internal control and they test the waters and they go ahead and they try what they think is a way to create this misappropriation and they see that it's working and all of a sudden the bell goes off in their head and they realize that nobody's watching, that they have an angle and they can get away with this, well, those 60% are going to make that attempt and they're going to try and, and cr basically commit that fraud. So the goal from an accounting person's perspective, the goal from a compliance person's perspective, the goal from a director of internal audits perspective, or a CFO is to manage that 60% of the population. That's really the goal. You may continue, Michael. Oh, sorry. I was just, uh, I made a terrible joke on mute, uh, so I'm glad nobody heard it. Um, <laughs> all right. Moving forward then, uh, revenue manipulation um, is, our, is our kind of most commonly observed area uh, where fraud occurs. And um, there, there are multiple reasons for this, one of them being revenue recognition as an accounting concept is somewhat flexible. Um, the company can elect uh, to to rely on uh, various accepted policies for when revenue is recognized, and uh, based on how th there are methods that companies can use to to increase or at least present the appearance of additional revenue while remaining somewhat within those standards, uh, and and that makes it oftentimes difficult to detect uh, or to prove. I'm going to run through a couple of, of examples here, and these terms may be familiar to some. Uh, channel stuffing is, uh, a, a, it's unfortunately remains common, uh, and that is when companies attempt to push inventory and material out to, for example, distributors, um, where uh, the material 
has still not actually been sold, but they are they, the arrangement that they've organized with their distributors is we'll send you our inventory, we're going to invoice you for it so that we can recognize the sale, but you don't have to pay for you don't have to pay us until you wind up sending it along to the to the end user or the end customer. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes, channel stuffing is used at the end of a reporting period to make up uh, make up for less than optimal performance uh, in the in the kind of remaining portion of the year. So, a typical scenario we see often is that to the fourth quarter, we're still ten million dollars below budget. All right, let's uh, let's see what we can organize. Out to the, the problem with channel stuffing and with a lot of these schemes, for example, Bill and Hold and and, uh, and others, is that they are not sustainable. So what we see often is this this uh, very noticeable spike, and this is something that when you're reviewing uh, your own statements, should be aware of. If you see a very noticeable spike in either the last quarter or the last month of a reporting period, followed by an almost uh, equally significant drop in performance in the following period, uh, that may well be an indication that there is some manipulation of earnings uh, going on. And in terms of it not being sustainable, I think if you kind of run it to its logical conclusion, if you keep pulling sales forward, to the current period, you're always going to have a hole at the beginning of the next period where those sales should otherwise and appropriately have been recognized. So companies oftentimes aren't able to keep up with that technique and uh, a restatement is oftentimes necessary. So and I, I've, literally, I, I've literally had cases where uh, companies have put product in their own trucks and shipped them across the street to a, a parking lot and reflected those as sales. Um, I've had situations where companies have loaded up off-site warehouses uh, which are owned by them or which they are renting out um, and reflected those products as being sales to outside entities. Um, it, it's um, unfortunately not a very uncommon occurrence. Right. Right, and with consignment sales, we're actually uh, involved in a matter currently where consignment sales are an issue, uh, and that is consignment. The the concept of consignment, which which many may be familiar with, is uh, will will provide the material for the product to either a distributor or an end customer, and there's no payment necessary. There's no bill until that product is either sold or consumed, uh, and again. To fill fill the difference between actual and budget, oftentimes uh, companies will will just bill. Um, so even though that's outside of the contractual arrangement, they may ask their customer, "Hey, do you mind if we just send you a bill? Uh, you don't have to pay it, but we're just going to send you a bill for that material that you're probably going to use uh, relatively soon, um, just to help us kind of meet our numbers." Yeah, I had a, I had a. I had a case recently which was a golf club manufacturer and um, we found it kind of odd that they were shipping product in October and November and parts of December um, not just to their southern locations but to many locations in the northeast uh, which were, were closed at the time because uh, there certainly was no activity in, in a lot of these golf shops. Um, if there was any activity, it was probably them just cleaning out old inventory. Um, so we started to ask the question, uh, started to look at the sales revenues, um, match the sales revenues to what the bonus incentives were, found that the bonus incentives mysteriously had been, had been hit as a result of that massive level of, of distribution to the Northeast. Uh, when we went out to these locations in the Northeast and started asking the question, well, we soon found out that all of these pro shops basically were told, listen, just take the stuff. You don't have to pay us for it. There's no obligation. We'd just like you to hold on to these things until later. And if you decide to sell the stuff, we'll take the cash. If not, you can send it right back to us. Clearly not a sale, but enough to, to generate significant, significant bonuses 
for many of the senior management people in the company. Yep, very interesting. And actually, you hit on uh, another important uh, element to review as the financial statement user is uh, the relationship between trends in sales and um, accounts receivable with the trends in the contra accounts, so the, the reserves and the accruals for losses that go along with those. Um, that could be, as Ken, you just mentioned, if, if there's an anticipation that if the company is aware anyway of an increased likelihood that this sale is going to result in a return um, or additional costs uh, as a result of this special arrangement, that needs to be under under uh, you know the accrual basis of accounting under GAAP, that needs to be quantified and captured in the period that the sale is recognized. So um, of course, people who are who are looking to manipulate wouldn't wouldn't respect that, but those are those are uh, places to be very aware of. So if you're seeing uh, the reserve, you know your your allowance for bad debts is remained constant, but your sales has doubled. Um, if your inventory reserves, which uh, are supposed to account for you know in, in inventory obsolescence, um, if they remain constant, but your inventory volume has significantly increased and your sales have dropped. You know, those are indications that these accruals uh, have not been properly managed and may, uh, may be appropriate for the financial statement user to ask very pointed and targeted follow-up questions. So that's, a, that's our kind of key takeaway to, um, to the financial statement users uh, on the phone is understand where judgments and estimates from management exist in the financial statements and how significant are those items compared to what uh, you know your your reason for reviewing the financials uh, and ask ask the questions make sure that you understand the, uh, the the basis for how those amounts are quantified the risks that management's considering in, in preparing them and uh, and prove it to yourself uh, hopefully I mean assuming that the information is available to you uh, that the trends that you're seeing line up and correspond with the trends uh, elsewhere in the financials. So sorry, I realize we're running close on time here. <coughs> Excuse me. I, uh, yes, um, there are no questions at this time. Um, we have like five minutes left. If anyone wants to ask a question, or if you want to wrap this up, uh, Ken and Mike. Sure. Okay. That's fine. Uh, there is one question. Let me see. Um, I just received. It says um, consignment sales are common. Are you saying that they are illegal or the time when the revenue is recognized is what makes it fraud or not? Yeah, so let me let me be uh, more clear on that because that's that's an important point. Is oftentimes and, and the and the revenue recognition standards uh, should often always be consulted in in this area. But my point was, if the arrangement that a company has with its consignment customers that they will be billed uh, for the inventory that has been given to them on a consignment basis. Once it's been consumed, meaning the, the, the customer has to use it or the customer has to sell it before that sale actually occurs, there are, we have seen instances where the consignor uh, will recognize the sale before that happens. So uh, essentially not respecting the terms of the agreement um, so that they can recognize sales early. There's certainly nothing intrinsically inappropriate about consignment. Uh, so, so apologies if that was not made clear. But just just to to add on to that, I mean, consignment sales are fine 
as long as the sale is recorded and reflected as a sale at the time when the commitment has been made by the consignee. Right. Right. Okay. Um, one more question was sent in, and it, they're asking, how is DSO reflected as a red flag? Sure. So, yeah, um, certainly, certainly DSO is not uh, in and of itself a problem. Uh, it would be a, an outpacing of DSO to sales. Uh, so, meaning, if you're recognizing a significant increase in sales volume, and you're also recognize, recognizing an increasingly increased time to collect on those sales, that can be an indication that some change has occurred, uh, and the company has either offered relaxed terms, um, or the company has, you know, I mean, under a worst case scenario, concocted the sales uh, and never expects to collect. Uh, and at a minimum, it means that that their reserve for doubtful accounts may need may need to be adjusted. So. That's that's really the relationship that was meant to be identified there. Right, and 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 to follow up on that, I mean, if you if you saw that the outstanding sales were were starting to really ramp up, you'd start to question. Well, you know, do we have a good collection department? Um, what are they doing with regard to to keeping on top of these sales? Um, are we going to have um, lots of potential? receivables that we are, are never going to receive and are we going to have to write off those receivables and reflect these as bad debts. Um, so there are lots of different pieces to that puzzle that come into play. But clearly if your, if your day sales outstanding start to get bigger and bigger, it's, there's definitely room for several questions. Definitely. Okay, um, Ken and Michael. We're running out of time right now. It is 3 o'clock. If anyone does have any questions, I will provide Michael's and Ken's email address when I send the PDF version of the presentation later today, and you can follow up directly. With that, we are going to close today's webinar. I would like to thank Ken, your Mark, and Michael Sullivan for taking the time to present to our group today and thank all today's attendees for taking time out of their day to join us. Thank you all again and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.